Good morning and welcome to this morning's oversight uh, subcommittee hearing on the, trans on the transparency and funding levels of state and local pension plans. According to the federal, state, and local levels of government, our country faces a growing burden of public debt. Too often, governments have deferred difficult choices by pushing obligations off into the future without responsibly saving for the day when those obligations are due. At the state and local levels, public employees are often promised defined benefit pension plans subsidized through the tax code that guarantee payments down the road. But the numbers suggest public employee pensions may be dangerously underfunded. This raises, crit uh, this raises critical questions about the promises public employers make, how pension liabilities are calculated, and whether greater transparency is needed to protect the lives and livelihoods of the men and women who depend on these pensions as they plan for their futures. Million, millions of state and local government employees participate in defined benefit plans. These include many of our most valued public servants, firefighters, police officers, emergency personnel, nurses and teachers. But too often state and local governments have not kept their end of the bargain and are failing to adequately fund employee pensions. Though there is argument about how best to calculate pension assets and liabilities, it is clear that there is not enough money set aside to meet future obligations. Economists estimate the plans were underfunded by as much as $3.8 trillion in 2009. The corresponding increases in state and local pensions, uh, pension contributions threaten to affect all Americans through higher state and local taxes and reduced services. This hearing will consider how accounting standards differ for public and private pensions. There is growing consensus that accounting standards for public sector pensions encourage state and local governments to overpromise, underfund, and take on risky investments by discounting guaranteed future benefits against unrealistic rates of return. <clears throat> Unlike private pensions, which are required by law to use more realistic accounting standards, public plans are held to a lesser standard and suffer from lax accounting methods that can hide the magnitude of the problem. Public plans can discount future liabilities by making risky investments, a practice that imposes added risk on the taxpayers, according to a new Congressional Budget Office report just released. Of course, some argue that state and local affairs are generally not the business of the federal government. But these plans are of increasing federal concern because of our tax code, which subsidizes retirement savings and gives preferential tax treatment to state and local debt. Furthermore, in our age of public and private bailouts, there can be little question to where state and local governments will turn when trillions in pension payments come due. And as if to underscore this threat, the recent proposed budget of the state of Illinois indicates that the governor might seek federal guarantees of future debt to cover pension liabilities. Finally, we also will discuss H.R. 567, the Public Employee Pension Transparency Act, which was introduced by Congressman Devin Nunes, a member of the full committee. As a condition to receiving preferred treatment under federal income tax law, H.R. 567 requires public plans to disclose funding data and honest valuations of plan assets and liabilities. Respecting the rights of states and local governments, the bill does not try to tell states how to fund or pay pensions. It merely promotes transparency in their funding. Whether the underfunding of state and local pension plans is hundreds of billions or several, several trillion dollars, uh, it is a serious concern. With more retirees drawing pensions by the day and some in government already raising the threat of a federal bailout of these pension plans, it is critical that the subcommittee take this opportunity to review the issue and consider how better to protect workers and retirees as well as the federal taxpayer. Before I yield to the ranking member, Mr. Lewis, I ask unanimous consent that all members' written statements be included in the record and, recently re and the recently released CBO issue brief titled, Underfunding of State and Local Pension Plans. Without objection, so ordered. And now I will turn to Mr. Lewis for his opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Bustani, for holding this hearing. Uh, last month, this subcommittee held a hearing to attack an organization that represents millions of seniors. At that hearing, I asked the chairman, who is next? Who else is on your list? Now I have 
an answer. This week is Teacher Appreciation Week, 2011. Today, Republicans have set their sights on the teachers who educate our children, police officers who keep our communities safe, and first responders in moments of crisis. They paint teachers, firefighters, librarians, and nurses as villains in their quest to widen the gap between the rich and the poor. Our neighbors are not the villain. They are not the cause of the current economic situation. They are simple, hard-working Americans trying to retire with dignity and escape poverty as they age. The Republicans have made many arguments to support today's attack. The Republicans blame pension plans for state budget shortfalls. This is not true. States spend less than 4% of their budget on pension contributions. The Republican claim that pension benefits are too high. This is not true. The average state pension benefit is modest, about $20,000 a year. The Republican also claim a federal bailout may be needed. This is not true. The losses in the plans are related to the market and the recent recession. The Republican claimed that their solution would create transparency. It would not. It would create confusion and lead to unnecessary cuts in vital state services. Given the fights, I ask myself, why are we here today? We both know that there is no immediate need for the federal government to take action. The committee has been looking at this issue since the 1970s. I'm also mindful that under the committee rules of this Congress, this subcommittee, jurisdiction is limited to oversight of existing laws. Our jurisdiction does not extend to select revenue measure. The sub subcommittee does not report out legislation. Therefore, any consideration of House Bill 567 would need to take place as well under the regular order of the committee. Based on all of this, I believe today's hearing is simple, a distraction from the Republican failure to create jobs. While the American people continue to wait for jobs, the Republicans are playing a dangerous game with the welfare of women, seniors, and non-teachers. It is time for the American people to take notice, stand up, and speak out. Today, I stand for American middle class, state and local workers across the nation. I thank the teachers for all that they do. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back my time. I thank the uh, ranking member for his opening statement. We will now turn to our panel of witnesses. I want to welcome the Honorable Walker Stapleton, Treasurer of the State of Colorado. Welcome, sir. <coughs> Mr. Josh Barrow, who is a fellow at, with the Manhattan Institute for Policy Research. Mr. Jeremy Gold, who provides pension finance consulting with Jeremy Gold Pensions. Mr. Robert Kurt Kurter, Managing Director of the U.S. State and Regional rating, uh, Ratings of Moody's Investors Services. And Ms. Iris, is it Lav? Lav. Senior Advisor with the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. I want to thank you all for being here today with us. Uh, you will each have five minutes to present your, your testimony here before the subcommittee with your full written statement submitted for the record. Uh, Mr. Stapleton, Mr. St uh, Stapleton, you can uh, now begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Bustani, Ranking Member Lewis, and members of the subcommittee on oversight. Thank you for the opportunity to testify this morning in support of the Public Employee Pension Transparency Act. My name is Walker Stapleton, and I'm the Treasurer of Colorado. Before being elected Treasurer last November, I spent my entire career in the private sector. I'm fortunate to have both an MBA and a graduate degree in business economics. One of the most important duties I have as Treasurer of Colorado is to serve as the only elected official on the board of our state's Public Employee Retirement Association, or PARA. PARA has nearly 500,000 members, including state workers, members of the state judicial branch, teachers in our public K-12 and higher education systems, local government workers, and members of our state patrol, among others. Last year, the Colorado Legislature passed pension reform legislation, which accomplished two main objectives. 
It lowered the cost of living adjustment from 3.5 percent to 2 percent, and it raised the, elig the eligible retirement age of members from 55 to 58 for educators and from 55 to 60 for everyone else. These are worthwhile reforms, but they unfortunately fell far short of the systematic improvements needed in Colorado's pension system to protect current and future retirees as well as Colorado's taxpayers. Let me discuss the lingering and growing challenges facing PARA and the key factor Colorado's pension reform legislation did not address. The system is operating with an unrealistic and unachievable rate of return, which is now set at 8 percent. In Colorado's case, PARA currently maintains an unfunded liability of more than $21 billion based on this 8 percent expectation. Of course, if this rate of return is lowered, the unfunded liability becomes far greater and, in my view, more realistic and transparent for PARA members and Colorado taxpayers alike. The question is whether states like Colorado should be in the business of guaranteeing market returns. If the answer to this question is no, as I believe it should be, then public pension plans like PARA need to start adopting rates of return in line with Treasury yields and stop the pervasive underfunding of plans. Overestimating a pension system's expected return is essentially gambling with the financial welfare of the next generation of Americans. As you may know, Wilshire Associates, a nationally recognized financial consulting firm, recently completed a study of 126 public pension plans, including Colorado's. Wilshire found that not a single plan would meet an 8 percent return expectation over the next 10 years. In Para's case, they have used an 8 percent rate of return to claim solvency over 30 years, meaning the only way they will achieve an average of 8 percent over the next two decades will either be to raise the rate of return even higher, which is fiscal fantasy, or to require members to contribute more for the benefits that they receive. It is also worth noting that approximately 25 percent of Paris' portfolio of investments is currently invested in fixed income products, yielding in the neighborhood of 4 percent, which requires the rest of the portfolio to return closer to 10 percent in order to average an overall return of 8 percent. The only way to achieve this unrealistic return is to take outsized market risk, further exposing our public pension plans to more volatility. If a default occurs, states, unlike private businesses, cannot declare bankruptcy and restructure, and taxpayers will be obligated to backfill resulting pension liabilities. The Public Employee Pension Transparency Act makes a lot of sense. While it is not mandatory for states to adopt, it categorically states that the federal government will not bail out a state's public pension system. This act increases transparency standards for public pension systems. Unfortunately, the Government Accounting Standards Board, or GASB, refuses to require this minimum level of transparency from public pension plans in its accounting standards. The GASB currently does not and will not in the future require plans to disclose a sensitivity analysis of discount rates so that plan members, local government leaders, and the public can assess for themselves what the underlying liabilities in these plans may be. Greater transparency and better information is important for everyone, for the fiscal health of our states, for elected leaders to make decisions and for our taxpayers to use when it comes to evaluating the significant liabilities associated with public pension systems in this country. I strongly support this legislation and I'm here today to urge every member of this committee to support the Public Employee Pension Transparency Act. Thank you. Mr. Barrow, you may proceed with your testimony. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Chairman Bustani, Ranking Member Lewis, for having me here today to talk about this important issue. Um, if you're trying to evaluate uh, the pension plan serving a state and local government, there are some simple questions you might want to ask about it, such as how much do the pensions pro we provide cost? How much do we owe to active workers and retirees? And over the next few years, how much more cash are we going to have to come up with to make our required contributions into the pension fund? But if you pick up the comprehensive annual financial report of most state and local pension funds in the United States, you will either find no answers to these questions or you will find incorrect answers to them. The recession has been driving pension contributions skyward uh, in states and localities all around the country, and many state and local governments are currently feeling the need to reform their pension systems. Indeed, 18 states enacted some sort of pension reform law in 2010. But because of this lack of useful financial information, many states have made underwhelming, financial ref uh, underwhelming pension reforms, and a lot of them are even coming back to do a second round of reform, having just done reform within the last 18 months. Um, as a couple of examples of the pressure that uh, localities are feeling, uh, Newark, New Jersey made $37 million in pension payments in 2009. They had to make $62 million for 2010. 
San Francisco will make $357 million in payments this year, and their city treasurer expects that that will rise to $800 million within two years. So how can the financial disclosures around pension funds be improved so that state and local lawmakers have better ability to make good choices about pensions? H.R. 567 would make several improvements to the way that pension funds make their disclosures, and there are some additional disclosures that these funds should also be encouraged to make. The most important change relates to the valuation of pension liabilities using a practice called fair valuation of liabilities or market valuation, as would be uh, encouraged by H.R. 567. Um, as, the H as the CBO said in a report just yesterday, fair valuation provides a more complete and transparent measure of the costs of pension obligations. Uh, using a fair valuation method will help states and municipalities and their taxpayers and bondholders better understand where they stand with regard to pension liabilities. States and cities also don't know what their future outlook looks like for the year-to-year -year cost of pension obligations. Um, even though pension funds, the way they smooth their asset returns, means that we can expect pension contribution rates to keep rising through about 2014 because of stock market losses in 2008 and 2009, most pension funds are not releasing projections of how those, of, of how those costs will move. So municipalities and states can't do effective budget planning because they don't know how big those cost explosions are going to be. H.R. 567 will require a 20-year projection of cash flows, um, which will give states and localities a better, better clarity about what their future costs will look like. Um, there are some additional transparency measures that uh, states and localities would be wise to adopt. Uh, one, again, relates to asset smoothing, that practice of gradually recognizing unusual gains and losses. Over the last decade, many states and localities or their pension funds have made opportunistic changes in the way they perform smoothing, either increasing or decreasing the length of the smoothing period to artificially inflate the appearance of financial solvency in their funds. In one case, New Jersey, such a shift was actually used to justify a 9% increase across the board in pension benefits that appeared affordable just because of this accounting trick. States should be encouraged to adopt a standardized smoothing practice so they do not have the option to game that system. Finally, public pension plans do not disclose what's called a normal cost of the, of, the pension payment, uh, of the pension benefits that they are awarding in a given year. That is to say, what is the present cost of all the promises we made to active workers this year in exchange for their labor? This is a standard feature of private sector pension disclosures, but you can't figure out when you look at a public employee pension, and it's not the same amount as the cash contribution that is being made into a pension fund. For this reason, uh, it is extremely difficult to do comparisons of the value of public and private sector compensation pack packages, we don't really have a good sense now of what the pension benefits that public employees are getting are worth. So why should Congress involve itself in this, which is a state and local issue? States don't understand how big a hole they've dug for themselves, and if the, uh, in certain states, such as Illinois, where the uh, funding ratio of pension plans has fallen to 38 percent, even under the, uh, the, the current GASB standards, which are too aggressive in terms of valuing the liabilities, the risk is that eventually you'll have clamor for a federal bailout of insolvent state and local pension funds that appear to be on the brink of being unable to make payments to state and local employees. It's better to avoid that situation now by giving state and local leaders the clarity they need to fix their own pension problems so that Washington does not have to later. Thank you, Mr. Barrow. Mr. Gold, you may proceed. Uh, good morning, Chairman Bustani, Ranking Member Lewis, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for this opportunity to present my views with respect to transparency and funding of state and local pension plans. My views are my own and do not represent any other persons or organizations. I'm an independent consulting actuary specializing in the financial aspects of pension plans. I will address the disclosure of the assets, liabilities, and costs of public pension plans in the context of H.R. 567. The disclosures at the heart of H.R. 567 are long overdue, and I welcome this bill. H.R. 567 is conceptually right. I will suggest three changes that will keep it right in concept and make it more useful and efficient in practice. The bill calls for two financial measures that are so fundamental that they must be made available to every decision maker and every interested party the market value of plan assets, and the current liability. H.R. 567 requires that the current liability be determined by discounting future cash flows using rates of interest 
derived from U.S. Treasury securities. In my written testimony, I quote former Federal Reserve Vice Chair Donald Cohn, who has explained why bulletproof promises should be discounted at rates derived from bulletproof securities. My first recommendation, H.R. 567 calls for averaging Treasury rates over 24 months and for segmenting rates for three different future periods. These ideas have been borrowed from private pension funding law, where they are used to reduce contribution volatility. H.R. 567, however, is not a funding bill. It is a disclosure bill. Good disclosure should use the Treasury spot rates at one point in time. We cannot spend average dollars, nor can we make good decisions based on liabilities that have been averaged. H.R. 567 calls for the fair value of assets at one point in time. The proper comparison liability must be based on spot rates at one point in time. The comparison of assets at market and liabilities at spot rates answers two questions that cannot be answered accurately in the pre-H.R. 567 world. First question, will future generation of taxpayers be paying for services provided to earlier generations? Second question, how does this plan's funding compare to plans in other jurisdictions? My second recommendation. H.R. 567 calls for extensive projections of future statistics that would be expensive and potentially uninformative. The subsections calling for these projections should be stricken. Eliminating the projection, along with the rate averaging and segmenting, should reduce compliance costs to a level that I would call modest in the first year and nearly negligible in subsequent years. My third recommendation. The bill should add a new item which will be very valuable and easy to calculate it. Mr. Barrow just referred to it. I call it the current cost. It is the portion of the current liability that has been accrued in the latest fiscal year. Current cost asks a third question that cannot be answered in the pre-HR 567 world. What is the market value of benefits earned by public employees this year? Current costs will make it possible to fairly compare compensation from jurisdiction to jurisdiction and between private and public sector employees. In summary, I recommend that we use spot treasury rates, not averaged, not segmented. I suggest the elimination of the 20-year projection requirement, and I suggest the inclusion of a defined current cost computed on the same basis as the current liability. I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gold. Mr. Curter, you may proceed. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Congressman Lewis, members of the subcommittee. My name is Robert Curter. I'm a managing director in the U.S. Public Finance Group at Moody's Investor Service. Thank you for inviting Moody's to participate in today's hearing. My comments will focus on our views of the potential credit impact of transparency initiatives like H.R. 567 and the Governmental Accounting Standards Board project on pension disclosure. While Moody's does not rate pension plans themselves, we monitor proposals like this, like these and the related developments because our assessment of government pension plans is one of the many factors in our credit analysis of government-issued bonds. Moody's comments on policy initiatives, however, should not be taken as an endorsement or criticism of any such initiative or the conduct of any particular issuer. In recent years, we have observed increases in the unfunded pension liabilities of state and local governments. This growth has occurred for several reasons. First, during periods of stock market, uh, uh, during peaks of the stock market in 2001 and 2007, some state and local governments enhanced benefits and or reduced employer contributions. Second, the recent economic downturn significantly diminished the value of pension plan assets. Third, Adoption of early retirement incentive programs shifted costs from payroll to retirement systems. And fourth, demographic factors, including an aging workforce and the increasing life expectancy of beneficiaries, are adding to liabilities. 
but state and local governments have needed to increase their pension contributions at a time when declining revenues are also requiring them to impose budget cuts. These developments have prompted a discussion about whether the existing disclosure standards about government pension plans remain appropriate, and also about whether and to what extent government pension plans are underfunded. In addition to the proposed legislation, the GASB is considering changes to its financial reporting rules for public sector pension plans. As I describe in my written testimony, if the GASB changes were adopted as proposed, employers subject to its disclosure requirements could calculate their funding requirements as they do now, but they would have to use different methods to calculate certain elements of the pension expense they disclose in their financial reports. Moody's believes H.R. 567 would increase public access to state and local government pension plan data. Additionally, both the bill and the GASB proposal would increase comparability of that data. At the same time, they could also increase the amount and complexity of the information disclosed. If these or other initiatives help investors and government issuers have more informed discussions about the credit risks associated with these obligations, we believe these proposals could create incentives for issuers to address their unfunded pension liabilities. Governments have many options to improve the funded status of pension plans. These include increasing government or employee contributions or adjusting benefits. Depending on the specific measures taken, these actions could be positive, neutral, or negative for bondholders. Though as noted earlier, any changes in the funded status of a pension plan would be one of the many factors that we would consider in our credit analysis. Of course, the decisions that governments make about their pension plans affect much more than their credit profile as bond issuers. Our opinions do not speak to the wider implications for an issuer or its stakeholders of any actions it takes. Also, as a credit rating agency, Moody's does not take a position on whether or how a state or local government should address a, a pension funding shortfall. Our role is limited to providing opinions and research about issuers' likely ability and willingness to pay their bonds in full and on a timely basis. Thank you again for inviting me to testify on this important matter. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Mr. Kerter. Ms. Lab, you may now proceed. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Congressman Lewis, and members of the subcommittee, I appreciate the invitation to appear before you today. I will make six related points, and I will then elaborate on the problems that I see with H.R. 567. First, as was mentioned, most state and local employees receive modest pension benefits, averaging less than $23,000 a year. Second, most states can address underfunding in their pension plans with relatively modest measures, such as increases in contributions from employers and employees and some sensible and moderate changes in benefits. Only a few states, those with pensions that are grossly underfunded and a history of failing to make required contributions, would have to make more extensive changes. Third, pension funds according to the Federal Reserve data, have already recouped two-thirds of their recession market losses. But smoothing and data lags have led recent studies to portray the situation as worse than it is. Fourth, the use of a so-called riskless rate, as we're discussing, to discount liabilities makes underfunding appear much greater than what pension funds report. But, the somewhat academic debate over whether or not to discount liabilities using a riskless rate is quite distinct from the actual finding of how much states and localities have to deposit in their pension funds to meet their future obligations. States and localities should use a realistic measure of future investment returns to set their deposit levels. Fifth, H.R. 567 I view as in many ways as a solution in search of a problem, one that would override the careful process that the Governmental Accounting Standards Board has nearly completed. The Board's proposed new rules would standardize state pension fund reporting and make it more transparent. Sixth and finally, moving state and local employees from defined benefit to defined contribution plans, which some sponsors of H.R. 567 have said they would like to see, would not address the funding problem that public pension systems now face. 
On the contrary, it would raise annual costs in many instances. Some states that were considering such a conversion have backed away after concluding that they would face higher costs. I will now elaborate on the problems with H.R. 567. For the past four years, GASB has been conducting extensive research and consultation and holding hearings with well over 100 stakeholders in order to develop new pension financial reporting standards. The draft GASB standard makes clear that the liability amount that results from the riskless rate does not properly reflect state and local government pension liabilities. Instead, GASB has carefully crafted rules that reflect market expectations and applies a lower discount rate only to the least well-funded plans in order to reflect the greater risk to their solvency. Congress should not replace GASB standards and the financial market discipline that induces state and local governments to comply with those standards with H.R. 567's a necessary federal, federal intrusion into the issue. Unlike the GASB process, H.R. 567 would likely increase public confusion between liabilities based on a riskless rate and actual liabilities. That could spook bond markets and lead states and localities to cut spending for education and other key areas or raise taxes more than necessary. It also would create an entire new federal bureaucratic structure to regulate something that market forces should manage. Most states with significant pension underfunding are moving to address it, and they are doing so in a variety of ways. They are increasing employee contributions, 11 states did that last year, and 16 states made changes that will reduce benefits for future employees. Some 12 states have raised their retirement ages. Other states have made changes that will require consistent employer contributions. States should be able to gradually solve their underfunding problems with the steps they are already taking, with, with modest increases in employer and employee contributions, with a greater recovery in the markets, and by adhering to the new rules that GASB will promulgate. The federal government does not need to intervene in this issue. In fact, that would do more harm than good. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lab. We'll now begin questioning, and I'll begin here with uh, Mr. Barrow. Some states and local governments have actually borrowed money in order to make contributions to their pension funds. And in, the, in these cases, government borrows money in hopes that the pension fund earns investment returns greater than the interest rate so that they can you know, remain solvent and meet their liabilities. This might work well if the investments actually earn a great, a great deal on returns, but what happens if the investment actually loses money? Are we, is this really constituting buying stocks on margin, in effect? That, that's really exactly what it is. Uh, one of the great champions of this was Governor Rod Blagojevich of Illinois, who put, pushed forward a $10 billion pension obligation bond issuance in, uh, it was either 2003 or 2004. Um, and yes, it, th this practice is, is purely a creature of the, of, the eight, of the use of discount rates roughly in the range of 8%. The idea is that the government can borrow around 5%, invest, earn an 8% return, and they're just getting free arbitrage there. Now, of course, the, the, the problem with that is that the, uh, the equity investments are risky and the payments that you have to make to the bondholders are fixed. Um, and so, yes, if, you, if the market performs poorly, it is exactly like buying stock on margin and losing. Uh, you shouldn't be under the illusion that because a state issues pension obligation bonds and uses them to buy assets to put in a pension fund, that it has somehow improved its overall fiscal solvency. The other thing I'd note is that it creates avenues for, for other chicanery, which we saw in Illinois, where the state issued $10 billion in bonds, but only used about $7.3 billion of the issuance to shore up the pension funds. The rest was used to service debt on the bonds and to close gaps in a couple of years of state budgets. So it's just another way for the government to make it, its books more complicated, hide borrowing, um, and further actually worsen a state's fiscal situation. Thank you, Mr. Barrett. Mr. Gold, you want to comment on that? I think you've got it right. I think Mr. Barrow has it right. Um, it is borrowing to invest in risky assets. Uh, I began writing about this when I did my dissertation in 1999, and um, all I've seen since then is greater and greater issuance. Uh, Illinois is one of the poster children, um, but a number of other states have uh, ventured down this uh, risky route. Thank you. Um, 
A new report released yesterday by the Congressional Budget Office said, and I quote, by accounting for different risk associated with investment returns and benefit payments, the fair value approach provides a more complete, transparent measure of the cost of pension obligations than the actuarial standards that are currently uh, in use. So for the panel, I'd like to each of you to, to address this. Do you think that CBO is correct or are current standards more accurate? Why don't we just start with uh, Mr. Stapleton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, one of the many reasons why I'm a strong supporter of this particular piece of legislation is that, in my view, the Government Accounting Standards Board has not done its job in uh, maintaining uniform standards that are in line with the Financial Accounting Standards Board, which govern uh, private sector companies. Uh, you can look at any number of things, uh, including uh, not fair, fair uh, value assessing uh, what the liabilities are. Uh, you can look at amortization rates. Uh, they allow the amortization period to be far greater under GASB rules and under FASB rules, uh, allowing for a smoothing of write-offs or write-offs over a much longer period of time. Uh, in the private sector, um, plan liabilities are valued separately. Uh, under GASB, plan liabilities, the expected rate of return equals the actual rate of return. Uh, in the private sector, liabilities are valued uh, using corporate high-yielding bonds, uh, which, are, which come out around 6%. Um, so, uh, and, and the issue of the sensitivity analysis, I was with Mr. Atmore, uh, the chairman of the, of the Government Accounting Standards Board a number of weeks ago. I asked him from a di disclosure standpoint, will you simply provide a sensitivity analysis so that people can judge for themselves, state leaders, public policy makers can judge for themselves what the, these liabilities may be? And, and he said no. And so I view this as a, as simply as transparency of information of people being able to reach their own uh, conclusions, whether it be state leaders or public policy makers. Thank you. Thank you. you Mr. Barrow? Yeah, I would just say briefly that I think CBO was absolutely right in its characterization of the appropriateness of the fair value method for valuing liabilities. And frankly, I, th I think it is a reflection of the near unanimity on, on this question in the financial economics community. It is often per portrayed as a debate, but you, the, the main parties that you see defending the 8 percent discount rate practice are pension fund managers and actuaries. I think that there isn't a good financial economics argument for the use of a discount rate uh, associated with risky investments to value a liability that is not risky. Mr. Gold. Um, in my comments, I made a distinction between a funding law, such as the PPA of 2006, and a disclosure uh, bill um, or proposals coming out of GASB. Um, there is a history um, which um, is built into actuarial methods uh, for guiding funding over long periods of time. And from that history developed uh, many of the uh, practices which found their way into ERISA, found their way into accounting, and so on. Um, financial economics um, is ex exactly the um, well, financial economics addresses the difference between um, a, an engineering approach to uh, developing contributions, uh, which at some future date will be adequate if things work out, and valuing uh, promises made today. And the financial economics or fair value approach uh, is far superior uh, for accounting purposes. Thank you. Mr. Curter? Yes, thank you. Um, we do believe that pension fund unfunded liabilities uh, may be overstated because earnings rate assumptions uh, don't reflect current market conditions, that directionally uh, those rates are too high. Uh, GASB uh, is um, considering initiatives to lower those rates, and several states have already, and, and pension plans have already taken actions to begin lowering those rates. Um, we don't uh, have an opinion about what the right rate is, uh, other than to note that directionally these are um, moving towards more realistic numbers. We look at uh, pension funding on a case-by-case -case basis for each credit involved, um, and uh, that this is really only one factor that we look at in our overall uh, credit assessments. Thank you. Ms. Lab? Um, I would not say that 8 percent is the exact right number right now. As uh, Mr. Curtis said, a number of pension funds are bringing that down, and one needs to figure out what the right number is. But um, the CBO talked about, about using its preferred method is using a municipal bond rate. 
um, adjusted for its tax exemption. And there are some, as they note in a footnote, there are a number of anomalies to that idea, which is that, um, for example, this is for disclosure. They, I should back up and say, they say that that does not mean that that should be the way that that, that um, funds contribute. As I said, those are two different things. But even using the municipal bond rate for, for disclosure has its problems. For example, the bond rate is higher in the states with the weakest um, fiscal si system. So you have a situation with a higher rate, you have lower pension liabilities disclosed if you have the worst fiscal system because your bond rate, your, the interest you have to pay is higher. That doesn't make any sense. Also, if you compare with corporate, which is in the six, six and a half percent range, they use their bond rates, but everybody knows that corporate bonds are more risky than municipal bonds. So they get to use a higher discount rate and show lower liabilities because their bonds are more risky than, than state and local bonds. So there are some basic fundamental problems with these conceptions that don't ma necessarily make sense in the actual world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank each of you for being here uh, uh, this morning. Uh, the question is for the entire panel. Uh, my time is limited, so I ask each witness to answer either yes or no <laughs> to the following question. Uh, do you support closing public pension plans? No. It depends on the state, but in most cases, yeah. yes. Yeah. And I'm sorry, I missed the word. I'm not uh, very good at hearing. Closing. Do I support what? Closing. Closing. No, I do not. Um, Moody's does not have an opinion on that matter. No, do you, I do, do not. Do you have a personal opinion? <laughs> Are you speaking for, for Moody? I'm speaking for Moody's. No. Let me uh, just ask, uh, does closing public pension plans save money, Ms. Ladd? Um, no. If you have unfunded uh, why, why, why not? If you have unfunded liabilities that, ex that exist from, from past service um, or from market losses, you still have to pay off those unfunded liabilities. And if on top of that you're creating a defined contribution plan, you haven't lost those liabilities, you still have to pay them off, and you have to put money into a defined contribution plan. And in fact, a defined contribution plan for any given level of, of um, retirement security you want to provide for your employees, which is important for attracting quality employees, then you have to put more money in a combined, combined in a, I'm sorry, in a defined contribution plan, like a 401k kind of plan, because then you don't have the benefits of, of uh, pooled investment in professional management. Uh, Ms. Lamp, I would like to understand more about the people who benefit from public pension plans. Um, sure. What, I mean, what type of state and local workers are eligible for public pension plans? Most state and local workers are. So we're talking about first responders. We're talking about correction officers. We're talking about teachers. We're talking about social workers and nurses and bus drivers, school bus drivers, a whole range of, um, of state and local workers. Uh, to continue, how much on average do these retirees receive in pension benefits? Across states, the census reports that they receive an average of about $23,000 a year. Uh, could you tell us whether all state and local workers participate in Social Security? Um, no, all state and local workers do not participate in Social Security. What, what are the exceptions? Um, the exceptions are quite a number of teachers, about 40% of teachers and a majority of public safety workers like police and fire. Um, and then there are some states, a few states, where most of the workers don't participate. So those workers need more from their pensions um, because they don't also have um, Social Security. Uh, could you tell members of the committee what is the purpose behind providing workers with pension benefit? What is the intent? Well, um, first of all, uh, studies that do what we call apples to apples um, comparisons find that public workers, particularly at um, you know middle and higher income um, or middle and skilled 
um, areas are paid less than their private sector um, counterparts. So we, um, pensions are part of their compensation. But in general, um, it, is it is important that people have retirement security, and this is part of how state and local governments ha attract quality workers to do the work. Um, and so um, they provide deferred compensation as well as current compensation. It's a choice that's been made. But thank you. An important one. Thank you. Thank all members of the panel. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank the ranking member. Uh, Mr. Buchanan, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for doing this most important hearing. I also want to thank our colleague, uh, Congressman Nunes, because I think it is very critical. I just think back, uh, we were being in business for a lot of years. We had profit sharing plans and 401ks that we have now. Um, but I look back in the last 10 years, and if you take a look at S&P, for example, uh, they're flatlined. If, uh, so my point is, I'm looking at these, uh, and I was thinking in 19, uh, in 2008, I was sitting around with a bunch of people uh, having dinner at Christmas uh, just before that, and there was maybe 15, a lot of them were investors and everything. And the market, uh, everybody lost a third of their net worth then. So when we talk about someone put a number together at 8% or 4% or 12%, and these uncertain times, you can come up with any number you want. I, I always refer back to the rule of 72, that if you've got a, a, you know, an 8% number, it doubles in, in nine years. Uh, but the bottom line, these are different times. So it just seems like we have to reassess where we're at. We need more transparency so that doesn't lead everybody into bankruptcy. So I, I mean, and I'll start with you, Ms. Lay. What do you think uh, a number should be today when you're looking to put together uh, what you might have to pay out in the next 10 or 20 years? What number, because if you look at the bond rate, uh, maybe there's been some appreciation. But if I look at interest rates today, it's almost free money if you're going to go into treasuries. And then the equity markets have been zero for 10 years on average. But historically, for a lot of years, they were 10 percent. But wh where do you even begin to get a number that makes any sense? That's why I'm concerned is more people retire. I mean, it, someone mentioned 8 percent. I mean, do we need to be dealing with 1 percent? Or what, what makes sense going forward that, uh, for the workers? I'm not going to put a specific number on it. I haven't done that research. That's not what I do. But I do um, know it's not, it's very unlikely to be 4%. Um, you know, I think that it would be somewhat irresponsible for states and localities just to invest in treasury bonds. I think that would not make any sense. That would not but you understand the S and P in the last ten years went down, has been down, has been flatlined, it's zero, uh, and it went down thirty eight percent in '08. I mean, how do you how do you get to a number of four, six, seven percent? I mean, with any confidence going forward? Well, I mean, pension returns have not been the return to pension funds have not been zero. Um, you know, the last what have they been couple the last of years, years, they've been in the double digits, and they were down during the recession, and they were, they've... Um, Do you know what they've been in they the last 10 years? Do you know what the returns have been in these pension funds on average? Take them across the board. What's the average for the last 10 years? Do you have any idea? I don't even, I don't even know that number, I but I know CBO my overall had, returns have not been CBO good. I think CBO had a number. It was in the neighborhood of 3% or something yeah. like that, but this was two back-to-back -back recessions. I certainly don't think that you necessarily want to plan for the future of having two, recess two recessions, right. one of them the largest since, you know, um, since the Great Depression within 10 years. I don't think that that's a realistic way to plan either. Well, to I just think that, that that's the, going the, to these are different times today. I'm an optimist, but at the same token, the reality of it is uh, a lot of people are reassessing where they're at. I can't tell you. I represent Florida. How many retirees that were hoping to uh, retire based on a six, eight, four percent number? They're not seeing those returns, so now they're working longer and those kinds of things. Well, for the Mr. Yield, yeah, uh, Mr. Buchanan, I want to thank you for your kind words. Microphone. It's on. Lights on. Uh, Mr. Buchanan, I'd like to thank you for your kind words on the bill. I want to make sure that. I know the boogeyman's out here and people are talking about 4% or 3% uh, and the detractors to this bill that are against transparency continue to use that rate of return as if that rate of return was meant that the federal government's now going to say this is what the return is going to be. Uh, the purpose in drafting this legislation had nothing when we looked at that rate 
was to do nothing other than to protect the workers from the employers, meaning the government. Uh, because it, it really, what, when, you, when we look at that discount rate of, you know, today, which would be around 4%, it's, it's not to do anything but compare oranges to oranges or apples to apples so that you can compare a plan in Fresno, California to a plan uh, in Florida. And that was the purpose of this discount rate. That's why we, that's why we put this in there, just have a conservative rate uh, that would, that, so you would be able to compare these plans across state lines and from entity to entity. Yeah, I, I thank the gentleman, but I, I guess my point in saying all this is I was trying to work towards the uncertainty that we've, we've faced in the last 10 years and we need more transparency. And I appreciate your effort. Thank you. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Uh, Ms. Jenkins, you're now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I want to thank you all for being here uh, today. Uh, I, I find it a bit ironic uh, that Congress, which doesn't have the political will to take action to fix Social Security, is here today talking about our grave concern uh, with our state and local government pension plans. Uh, uh, but uh, I, so I'm not sure that any of us have much credibility on this issue, but I have great respect for the panel. In particular, as a former uh, president of the National Association of State Treasurers, a state treasurer myself, and a board member on our public uh, employee retirement system in Kansas, I, I really have uh, the utmost respect for state treasurers. So I would like to address some questions uh, to Treasurer Stapleton. Uh, some have commented uh, that this bill, H.R. 567, is unnecessary because the governmental, Government Accounting Standards Board, GASB, already provides standards for state and local pension plans. I just would like your response to that. Uh, this, is, this is not the case. Uh, GASB's standards has, have, in my opinion, have basically permitted plans uh, not only to adopt their own rates of return, but basically act like the Wild West when it comes to assuming plan returns. That's why there's no... Uh, credible levels of comparison between plans. Uh, I spoke earlier about uh, differences in amortization length. Obviously, the longer the amortization period, the less you have to write off in a given amount of time. Uh, under the Financial Accounting Standards Boards, which, which govern the private sector, it's a much shorter length of time to, uh, to write off plan assets. I've been very disappointed uh, with the oversight of the Government Accounting Standards Board and their refusal to transparently uh, invest in information that will allow public policymakers to make informed decisions. <laughs> uh, I see this bill as a nonpartisan bill, as a bill to increase information. Uh, whether 4 percent is the right rate of return, I, I can guarantee you that 8 percent is not the right of rate of return. If you go into the insurance market and try and get a private contract or somebody to guarantee you a rate of return, you will never find somebody that will guarantee you an 8 percent rate of return. States have increasingly tried to regulate the insurance industries, uh, and, and, the, and uh, when they've done that, uh, they've been required plans to have more assets and liabilities. Uh, and so if GASB had done its job or would do its job uh, and require the same standards uh, that are applicable in the private sector, uh, we wouldn't need to be here today. Uh, but it's refusing to do that, and so plan members are not getting a, tra uh, a uniform level of information to assess uh, liabilities. And public policymakers need this information for state governments to responsibly respond uh, to these liabilities. Because the fact of the matter is, is that plans are not uh, taking the advice of their own actuaries. Just look at what happened, which was chronicled in the Wall Street Journal with CalPERS a few weeks ago. Uh, they uh, told the board to lower the rate of return. Then they started getting letters in from school districts, from local governments around the state that said, we cannot afford for you to lower the rate of return. And they said, we are going to discount the professional advice of our actuaries and create, in effect, a deferred liability for future generations. And we cannot allow that to happen. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, the, the bill, the Public Employee Pension Transparency Act, is not mandatory, uh, but does condition the continued ability to issue tax-exempt bonds upon filing certain information about state and local pension plans to the Internal Revenue Service. As a state elected official, do you think that's fair? Absolutely. This is, you know, this does not force compliance. There is a carrot 
uh, with, which is uh, tax-exempt bond financing. Uh, but even if states comply, after they comply and issue this information back to the plan holders and back to their states, they still don't have to adopt the rate of return. Uh, it's just a way to get uh, greater information. And as I uh, said earlier, I asked Mr. Atmore uh, at the Government Accounting Standards Board, what is the problem with providing a sensitivity analysis of different discount rates? Let's look at 8 percent, let's look at 6, let's look at 4 percent, but let's make sure that public policymakers at the state level have a wide range of information from which to reach conclusions. Okay. And he said no, that, that in, the, in the coming standards that he will not provide that information. Great. And finally, in your testimony, you said overestimating a pension system's expected return is essentially gambling with the financial welfare of the next generation of Americans. Can you explain uh, what this gamble uh, places at stake for the next generation? And is it fair to say that this gamble could also impact the current generation through decreased services, increased taxes? Well, one of the things that, that opponents of this legislation and of uh, transparency with public pension plans in general like to point out is they try and make apples to oranges comparisons with the private sector plans. Uh, they'll say, well, look at the underfunding in private pension systems. Uh, the problem is, is that structurally you're talking about two different things. First of all, uh, as I mentioned earlier, private plans have a different valuation assessment for what their liabilities are. They peg it to high-yielding corporate bonds at 6 percent. Uh, that does not happen in public pension plans where the expected rate of return equals the actual rate of return. But structurally, unless I'm an investor in a private company with a lucrative defined benefit plan, I don't really care because I'm not going to be on the hook. But in the public pension system, uh, all taxpayers at the state level are on the hook if the plans become insolvent, because the state of Colorado is not going to let the Jefferson County School District go insolvent without finding a way for funding. And we're bankrupt, like a lot of states, and the only people that can actually make up the difference are the taxpayers. And that's why it's important that we have this level of transparency so that everybody can know where we stand and, and can take public uh, policy actions to remedy what I believe is a very serious problem. Thank you. Treasurer, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kine, you're now recognized for five minutes. Great. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I thank the panelists for your testimony here today. And you know, as a Democratic representative from the great state of Wisconsin, uh, I have to admit, we've kind of received our fair share of attention the last couple of months in the, in the media, both at home and, and nationally. And this may seem a little heretical to my Democratic colleagues up here on the dais, but uh, I commend Governor Scott Walker and what he did. I think what he proposed in the state of Wisconsin was incredibly bold and courageous in recognizing the deep fiscal hole that we were in and coming forward with the bold proposals that he, that he did. And quite frankly, the fact that hundreds of thousands of people showed up in sub-freezing weather, braving bitter wind chills, blowing snow, uh, bitter winds in their face um, in both the square in Madison and in virtually every city throughout the state of Wisconsin. I got to believe that they wouldn't have done that if they had all the facts, if they knew the real fiscal crisis that our state was facing and how bold uh, the governor was really trying to address these issues. Because if they had known that the state public pension uh, fund w was only funded at 99.8 percent and that that 2 percent, 0.2 percent shortfall was creating a deep fiscal hole for our state, I, I can't believe that they would have been out there for weeks and months on end protesting what the governor was trying to do with the state public pension uh, system. I mean, they wouldn't have been so selfish and so self-centered in the demonstrations that they were conducting throughout the state of Wisconsin. No, I think not. I, knew, I think those individuals, those workers, those families knew exactly what they were doing when they were out there protesting what the governor and the Republican legislature was trying to jam down their throats. This had nothing to do with the budget crisis that the state of Wisconsin was facing. In fact, Governor Walker was just here in this town a few weeks ago and admitted in testimony before Congress that his assault on worker rights had absolutely nothing to do with the budget situation that we face in the state of Wisconsin. In fact, they stripped that portion out of the bill and therefore admitted for the entire world that it had nothing to do with the budget implications. But nevertheless, the public employees knew that they had to be a part of the solution and they were willing to contribute more to their state public pension system. They were willing to contribute more to their health care system. In fact, Governor Walker got every concession that he was asking for from those public employees. But that wasn't good enough. He had to go after those worker rights and strip that away, basically telling them, you no longer have a seat at the table and your voice isn't going to matter anymore. 
and we're going to jam these decisions down upon you. So it was not surprising seeing hundreds of thousands of people going out and braving that cold water and those, that bitter wind chill day after day protesting what Governor Walker was doing in the state of Wisconsin. If we want to have a serious conversation about the fiscal hole we're facing at the state and federal and local level, let's talk about the real cause of what's driving these budget deficits, which is rising health care costs. Now, my Republican colleagues have a proposal on how to deal with it. And that's going to the workers of the country, to seniors, to disabled people, to children, and saying, you contribute more to your health care plans. And that's it. They're not proposing anything to deal with rising health care costs. And that's just going to shift the burden more and more on working class families throughout the nation. Or there's another approach we can take. And that's through the health care reform measure that we passed that will reform the way health care is delivered in this country and ultimately how we pay for it. So it's based on the value and no longer the volume of care that's given. And, and, you know, surprise, surprise, this has been a bipartisan agreement for many, many years. Some of the most prominent names in the Republican Party, from Newt Gingrich to Bill Friss to my former governor and, and former secretary at HHS, Tommy Thompson, Mark McClellan, they've all been saying we've got to go to a value or outcome-based reimbursement system in the health care system or it will bankrupt us. That's what's driving the fiscal crisis at the state and local level. That's the largest and fastest growing area of spending at the federal level. That's what we should be focused on instead of some one-size-fits-all Washington approach to the state public pension system. 99.8% funded in the state of Wisconsin. And yet, look at all the attention that we garnered as a state over the last uh, couple of months. Now, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to, with unanimous consent, submit for the record uh, a letter dated May 4, 2011, to me from the Secretary of the Department of Employee Trust Funds, Dave Stella, from the state of Wisconsin. Without objection. In the letter, he, he adamantly opposes H.R. 567. And in fact, uh, in the last paragraph, and I quote him, he says, thus, contrary to what the proponents of the legislation su suggest, the issue is not a current lack of transparency and disclosure. It is simply an effort to justify a federal takeover of areas that are the financial and regulatory responsibility of state and local governments. You know, for the party that claims to be the party of less government in Washington and more responsibility at the state, proposing this one-size-fits-all approach with this federal les lesson is contrary to even, I think, your principles. And our own uh, a secretary back in the state of Wisconsin is opposed to this legislation. So I think we could spend a lot more time on the issues that are really driving these budget deficits rather than some type of Washington one-size-fits-all approach. Gentlemen's time's expired. Uh, we just had a vote called. There are two votes, one's a 15 and one's a 5. I think what we'll do now is go to Ms. Black for questioning, and then we'll recess afterwards. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, under the current Government Accountability or Accounting Standards Board rules, uh, public plans can discount their pension obligations based on expected rates of return on pension assets, as has already been talked about in some detail. Um, by putting their value into the stock market, private equity, and other risky investments, state and local plans can decrease the current actuarial value of their liabilities. Now, the Gatsby rules are contradictory to basic finance theory that I think has already been said here by a number of our panelists and the practice of financial markets where discount rates are based on risk characteristics of liability, not asset. And Congress actually um, has banned this type of accounting for single employer private pensions, um, but yet we're still using it in the government. Um, do you believe that Gatsby rules encourage uh, state and local governments to take on inappropriate risk with these plant assets? And also, um, added to that, do you believe that H.R. 567 uh, would have an effect on this practice? And you can start with Mr. Stapleton, if we can, and just go down the panel. Thank you, thank you Ms. Black. Yes, I do uh, believe that uh, that the uh, lack of uniform standards required by the Government Accounting Standards Board has allowed uh, state plans to very dangerously adopt over-realistic over rates of return. Uh, even if you look at an actuarial analysis, which is called uh, a Monte Carlo analysis, it is often provided to states, uh, they talk about the probability of achieving different rates of return. Uh, in Colorado's case, uh, there is almost a 30 percent chance that we will not achieve an 8 percent rate of return. 
Uh, if I told you and other members of this committee that there was a 30 percent chance that they would be in a life-threatening car accident on the way to work today, I think I'd have a lot of people biking. Uh, yet essentially that is the risk that we are taking day in and day out uh, with the state's tax money, um, assuming these rates of returns. Mr. Barrow? I'd agree with that, and I think we see that in the political resistance to plans that are lowering uh, uh, assumed rates of return. In New York, we just had a reduction in the rate of return assumed for the state employee retirement system, and yet, uh, just coincidentally, the plan happened to at the same time adjust other actuarial assumptions with regard to longevity and such that happened to largely offset the effects of the, uh, of, of the reduction in the rate of return. So I think there is uh, significant resistance to, uh, to reduced rates of return, and in order to not lower the rate, you have to invest in an aggressive manner. The other thing I'd note is that the defense of this aggressive investment is essentially that the government can be indifferent to, uh, to variability and risk in, in asset returns because the government's going to be around forever. It has this superior ability to take on risk. And the implications of that are, are really kind of perverse. Um, Pension funds happen to be vehicles through which we make promises to public employees and through which we invest in assets. But these are fundamentally unlinked activities, and there's no reason that a government couldn't just create essentially a sovereign wealth fund by issuing bonds and then using the proceeds to invest in equities. If the government really has a superior ability to take on risk, we should be doing a lot more of that. States mm -hmm. should issue as many bonds as they can, use them to buy up as much stock as they can, and use that as a cheap source of financing for government activities. Now, obviously, that makes no sense because it would involve government governments taking on tremendous and inappropriate investment risk. But that's exactly what they do through public employee pension plans. Thank you. Mr. Gold? Um, the best financial theory, um, uh, and brought to our attention by uh, famous economist Fisher Black, um, indicates that um, pension plans uh, should not be investing in risky assets, but should be investing in bonds. Um, I've, I've written that the um, measurement using the expected return on assets rather than a reference bond portfolio uh, does enable, at the very least, and encourage perhaps uh, risky investing, which otherwise a uh, financial theory would not support. Mr. Carter? Yes, uh, we think that the, um, uh, the preliminary views report of GASB, the project to uh, review uh, pension and accounting standards for public uh, sector pensions. Uh, this bill, the many reports that have been issued on this subject recently, uh, help to increase transparency and improve the quality of the debate between issuers and investors, uh, thereby improving the amount of uh, and the quality of information in the market. Uh, to the extent that transparency is improved, the comparability is improved, we think this helps to create incentives uh, to issuers to help address funding shortfalls. Uh, and improves the overall quality of um, information available to investors. Ms. Lab. Well, the fact is that over the last 20 or 25 years, uh, they have, the funds have earned close to 9 percent. Over the last 10 years, they've earned 5 percent. I didn't have that number in front of me before. And over the last about 25 years, that um, 60 percent of the revenue to these funds has come from investing, has been investment income. So um, it does appear that the funds have invested prudently. They've made very good returns. And I think having them invested in bonds would be entirely in bonds would be wrong to the taxpayers of, of the state uh, who, would, who are missing out on the potential of these returns to finance the, the pensions. Thank you. General Lady's time has expired. Uh, we'll now go to Mr. Marchant for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Lev, uh, who, who, in your opinion, is the biggest loser if a pension fund uh, goes broke or is severely underfunded? Well, ultimately, the pension funds are, in essence, backed up by the full faith and credit of the state. Um, and the, so, in the very unlikely situation that a major pension fund would not be able to pay benefits, um, presumably they would pay it from current tax dollars. Um, that's how they paid, you know, be, prior to the 1970s, um, all state and local pensions just about were paid on a, on a pay-as-you-go basis. 
They were not, there were not these pension funds. And then the, they started investing and pre-funding their pension funds, you know, around 1980. And they built up this $3 trillion fund in the pensions. And pensions are not, you know, in, in, in danger of not being able to pay their, their benefits. Uh, that's just not the case in, 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 in most situations. I mean, <clears throat> if you want to look at the most extreme, even Illinois will be able to pay its pensions. So, so. You, you don't feel like there's any benefit to an additional amount of transparency for the employees that are going to benefit from the pension system? You know, transparency is a word that's used in a lot of different ways. And when, when what's called transparency puts out up a construct that really isn't how much, that, that is different from how much states and localities have to invest in order to make their pension funds holes and to pay their obligations, then you have confusion rather than transparency, in my opinion, uh, because uh, you have two different numbers and people don't know what to think about it. And if they look at an inflated and a very large liability, then some other things are going to happen. People are going to try and raise taxes to fill it. People are going to cut other programs or they're going to say, oh, we can't keep this pension fund. We're going to have to go to a defined contribution or something else because so, um, so it's you're, huge liability. You're, it's confusion. Your theory is that transparency increases uh, confusion. No, I, not necessarily any transparency. I'm saying that I don't think that this is what we're talking about here is um, good transparency. I think that what Ed GASB is proposing in its new rules is good transparency. Um, uh, it has a, it, um, you know, a much more realistic view of what it, how it is that, uh, of the funding level and the liabilities of pension funds. Well, in my uh, previous career in the state uh, legislature, I served on the Texas uh, Pension Review Board. Uh -huh. And uh, it was not a, a review board that took very seriously its responsibility for years until we got a governor that decided that maybe we ought to meet and maybe we ought to actually do our job. And we found that when we, and, and our job was simply to just publish the same kind of information that's in uh, this bill, and we found that it was not, it, we got the most resistance from the public entities that, uh, that administrated these plans, and we got the most enthusiasm and the most inquiries from the actual employees that once they were able to look at the, disclose, the disclosure and the comparisons of the Dallas pension, fund, Dallas Police and Fire Pension Fund versus the El Paso Police and Fire Pension Fund, that's when we began to, our main input came from the employees, and we found that the increased transparency benefited really the employees because they then began to demand an accountability uh, from the pension funds that they were depending uh, on for their retirement. Uh, I think your first answer was very telling in that, uh, in your opinion, the ultimate loser is not the employee, but the state or the entity. Uh, and and uh, I think that at some point, uh, the employee needs to be uh, more worried about the content and the investment policies and, and the transparency of their pension planning and, and cannot always rely on uh, the state or the county or the city or the school district bail a system out? Well, that would be a very rare situation. I think the GASB rules will create the kind of transparency and comparability that you're talking about, which I think is good and important. And um, well, We found that GASB was a reactive entity and not a proactive entity. And that, well, it's changing. that was our experience. <laughs> The gentleman's time has expired. The committee will stand in recess until we complete this ra the round of votes on the floor. I anticipate it will be about 20 minutes. Uh, at this time, uh, Mr. Becerra is recognized for questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for your testimony today. Appreciate that very much. One of the things that I'm sensing is that there's a disconnect between what we're doing here in Washington, including this conversation here and what the American public is feeling. 
In a recent survey of the public, and let me go ahead and cite it, the National Institute on Retirement Security, it's a survey, that survey found that the vast majority of Americans believe that the disappearance of, of pensions has made it harder for them to achieve the American dream. Some 75 percent of Americans believe that. And it sounds like more and more politicians are talking about eroding or eliminating the opportunities for Americans to have these pension plans. Uh, sometimes the public conveys to us that they don't believe that we're listening or that we understand how difficult it is for them to prepare for retirement. Uh, some 80 percent of Americans responded to the survey saying that precise point. And they responded by a percentage of 81 percent saying that they think that we should make it a higher priority to ensure more, more Americans, not less, but more Americans can have a secure retirement. And so as we hear this discussion about public pensions and we take a look at the, the real facts, I wonder if the American public is actually not way ahead of us in talking about this because if the public believes that we don't get it, they might be right because my understanding is that the average pension in America for most public employees is somewhere in the low 20,000s not 80,000, not 150,000. Now, they may be confusing that with the big uh, parachutes and buy, buyouts plans that they, they heard about in, during this Wall Street scandal where executives were getting billions of dollars or millions of dollars in buyout monies, even though their companies were failing. But these are public employees who put in many, many years, most of them more than a decade or two, to be able to collect some twenty to $25,000 a year in retirement. Uh, at the same time, my understanding is that for most states, the cost of having these pensions for their public employees translates to less than 4 percent of their state budget. Now, I know my state's having a tough time. I know any number of states that have been having a hard time. But I dare say that eliminating the pensions that have been paid into by employees uh, over decades and getting rid of the opportunities for American workers to lead out their lives in retirement in dignity is what folks would expect of us. Uh, I got to believe that the teachers who have been paying into the system, who have been working for so many years, the firefighters, the police officers, the public employees throughout America who have been working for less money than their private sector counterparts because pay scales in the public sector are a little lower, but they get a little bit stronger and better protected pension benefits, uh, that I, I got to believe that those American workers are saying, you're not listening to us. Well, we want some help, but please don't target our pensions at a time when we want the most safety. So I, I have a question to ask. Is it the case that there is any state that has said to us, we need to have a federal budget Bail, uh, a federal bailout of our pension system. I know Illinois was mentioned. Illinois was mentioned. Has Illinois requested a, uh, uh, Ms. Lava, you may have already commented on this, I was told, but has Illinois requested a bailout from the federal government for its pension program? No, it has not. There is, in a 472-page budget, there was one phrase, not even a sentence, which says significant long-term improvements will come only from the additional pension reforms refinancing the liability and seeking a federal guarantee of the debt, or increasing the annual required contributions. So there was that one phrase in which a federal guarantee was mentioned, but a couple weeks later the Wall Street Journal asked Governor Quinn, and it, there's an article which says he said, no, no, we're not um, planning on doing that. Let me, ask, and, let me ask a quick question. Is there anyone who challenges the figure that the average benefit, benefit uh, pension benefit for public employees throughout America is around $23,000, $24,000 a year? That comes from the U.S. Census, I don't think. Okay, so I, I, no one would question I that. Know. I know. Mean, Does anyone question that the average cost for a state throughout the country of the 50 states is somewhere around 4 percent or less of their state budgets? Right. The most recent data shows 3.8 percent. I would challenge that idea. Okay, Mr. Barlow. 
That's the that's a measure of the actual cash payments made yes. by governments. That's not the cost of pension benefits that are being provided. But then that doesn't that go to the question of what we're talking about in terms of a state's budget? A state is budgeting for a fiscal year, not for 20 years from now. Well, that's part and of the so problem. That, if I could finish my point, and so uh, while I think where you're heading is that we want to make sure that these are these pension plans are solvent for years to come, just the way we want Social Security to be solvent, we wouldn't use today's money that's contributed for a, a program that we need today to pay for a program that has to go long term. And so what we have to do is deal with the long term costs of a pension program. And I know my time has expired, Mr. Chairman, if I could just finish this point. We want to deal with the long term costs of a program through long term solutions, not short term solutions. So the short term solution of fixing a state budget should not be foisted on a long term program that has been funded for decades and is supposed to last for decades to try to solve a short term state budget, which is caused principally by the downfall, the economic recession and so forth. So it could be in a few years we are doing very well and that means pensions will be doing very well. And so what we want to do is budget long term for pensions, not sh have a short term site and deal with state budgets through our pension programs for our workers. Mr. Chairman, thank you for you, uh, allowing me the uh, additional time. The gentleman's time has expired. Mr. McDermott, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This morning uh, we are gathered once again to watch the Republicans attack the middle class and watch them ignore the problem of jobs in this country, uh, <clears throat> although there is a twist this morning because this is a subcommittee that has no jurisdiction whatsoever on pensions. Uh, they had to find a committee that would have the hearing because other subcommittee chairmen would not attack unions, so they brought it into this committee. Now we are sitting here while they cynically abuse the committee process to beat up on the working people of this country. If the public wonders why our politics are polarized, it is because all of the incremental steps of abuse this morning is another example. Let us be clear. The Republicans hate defined benefit pensions, whether it is Social Security at the Federal level or it is a public pension at the State level. They want rid of them all. That is what Wisconsin was about and it is what this whole exercise here today is. Now, <clears throat> instead of focusing jobs, they are going after their political enemies. Once again, the regular whipping boys, the unions. Let us drag the unions out here and kick the living daylights out of them when in fact they are not the problem. Unions built this country. They built the highways, the ports, the schools. They created fairness, the eight-hour workday, safe working conditions, health care, pensions. They are not the robber barons in this society. And union workers are under attack because they haven't gotten poor enough. They are under attack because they haven't given up, as they showed in Wisconsin. After two decades, the 80s and then the 2000s, where the Republican policies led to huge deficits, transferring most of the wealth to the top 5 percent in this country, you would think they would be satisfied. But they aren't. Here we are, back at the same old stand, attacking the pensions of policemen and firefighters and teachers and sanitation workers. Now, it is good that we found who the enemies are in the society, the police, the fire, and the teachers, and the sanitation workers. Let us take away their pensions. Let us destroy the system we have developed in this country. There is no problem with most state pensions. State of Washington is 99 percent financed. Wisconsin is 99 percent financed. You look at all the records that come from all the agencies, the Pew Foundation and others, and it is very clear that these pensions are not in trouble in most places. There are some states, but for the federal government to leap in to fix New Jersey or Illinois or whatever and make Washington go through that process is an abrogation of state rights and there is no sense in doing it. You, the, some of the witnesses here have said things about public officials at the local level which I think you ought to take back because some of them have been very responsible. In my state, we have a, fun, we have a functioning system that is well financed. Now, the CBO put a report out and the chairman kindly put it into the record. And Ms. Lav, I would like you to comment on this, on this line in this. Uh, it says, by indicating a larger amount of underfunding, Adopting a fair value approach in reporting pension financing, 
could indicate a need for significant increase in funding which would further strain state budgets, despite the fact that on average a much smaller increase in funding might turn out to be significant to cover pension plan fundings. It sounds to me like what they're trying to do with this bill is jack up the pressure on states, therefore they'll dump the pension plan. Is that a fair reading of what this bill is about? Well, I think that is a, a, a pretty fair reading. Um, the, um, you know, I think that some of the sponsors have said that, um, as is indicated um, in my written testimony. The, um, I think that what it will do is create this idea that there is just this massive underfunding and people will demagogue that. You know, you have it all in one place, you have a trans so-called transparent, maybe it's on a website, everything, and with these very large liabilities and people are going to demagogue and say, oh my God, we can't afford this and it's going to create pressure um, either to eliminate the plans or pressure to cut other spending or pressure for higher taxes. And, it, and given the volatility of the bond markets and people that invest in state and local mutual funds that, that um, having to, mutual funds for state and local let bonds. Me, let me stop you there, there because you brought up the bonds, the bond yeah. market. Mr. Chairman, I would ask unanimous consent to put into the record the Huffington Post article uh, on called Credit Rating Agency Analysts Covering AEIG Lehman Brothers Never Disciplined. I think we ought to have a hearing on that. I yield back the balance of my time. Without objection, that, uh, that report will be put in the record. Uh, I would remind the gentleman that uh, it's a little unseemly to impugn motives uh, of members of the committee uh, and other members of the House uh, the purpose of this hearing is simply to explore the issue of transparency and whether or not the accounting methods being used accurately depict the liabilities. And so with that, I, uh, the Chair now recognizes Mr. Nunes. For five Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I also would, would like to uh, remind the committee here that uh, when the public employee pension transparency bill was introduced in the House, it was the House parliamentarian that referred the bill to the committee. Uh, also, uh, it amazes me that now CBO is part of the vast right-wing conspiracy uh, to, to take out public employee unions. Uh, it also, uh, I, have a, I have a quote here that I'd like to read from, a, from another uh, uh, far right-winger. Some of you may recognize the name of Mayor Willie Brown, Mayor of San Francisco. Uh, he was also the California Assembly Speaker for many years. Um, I, I guess he's now a right winger because I'm going to read this and must be against unions, but here's his quote. The deal used to be that civil servants were paid less than private sector workers in exchange for an understanding that they had, a, had job security for life. But we politicians, pushed by our friends in labor, gradually expanded pay and benefits to private sector levels while keeping job protections and layering on incredibly generous retirement packages that pay ex-workers almost as much as current workers. Talking about this politically is politically unpopular and potentially even career suicide for most office holders. But at some point, someone is going to have to get honest about the fact that 80% of the state, county, and city budget deficits are due to employee costs. Either we do something about it at the ballot box or a judge will do something about it in bankruptcy court. And if you think I'm kidding, just look at the city of Vallejo, unquote. So when, when the bill was put together, it was put together to protect the employees. And, and Ms. Lav, it amazes me that, that, that you don't believe that transparency is good for the employees. Why is it that you want to hide the numbers from the public employees? I think transparency is very good. But you said earlier have, that they would get confused, would create confusion. Well, because I am saying that it, that I am not defining, forcing the, this um, uh, estimation of liabilities uh, at, at a riskless rate as transparency, because I think it is more in the in the uh, category of um, something that is a not relevant particularly to the, to the level of contributions that state and local employees should be making to their plans. And what should be disclosed to people 
is how much it is that this state and this locality have to put into their plans to reach full funding over the next couple of decades and you know as as we recover from these back to back recessions and that is the amount that i think you should be transparent about so people have an idea so employees have an idea so the public has an idea so, uh, the investing public and everybody else has an the, idea the bill what has to be put into you, those accounts the bill allows for two basically two basic themes one is for the pension plan to show how they feel they're going to meet the needs. The other is this discount rate that you seem to be uh, fixated on uh, and that the left seems to be fixated on. And, they, and for some reason, you can't get off of this fixation about 3%, 4%, 5%. The truth of, of why the rate was picked is what I said earlier to Mr. Buchanan, is so that you would have a conservative ability to compare public employee pensions across the line. And I will also say that uh, it amazes me how this has now turned into a union, Wisconsin, uh, vast conspiracy uh, bill here when I think half of the, the public employee pensions are actually for non-union employees. And so, uh, you know, I think hopefully we can just really raise the rhetoric level down a little bit here uh, this, is, this is a good government bill. It's trying to create transparency so that public policymakers can make better decisions. Uh, and, and with that note, uh, Mr. Stapleton, uh, can you just kind of comment on, on, I know you didn't get a chance to respond to, to some of the members on the, on the Democrat side and, and some of their accusations, so I'd like to give you an opportunity to respond. Thank you, Congressman Nunez. I would, I would simply say that Everybody benefits, in my opinion, from greater information. I think that a risk-free rate of return is absolutely as justifiable, if not more justifiable, than assuming an 8% rate of return. In Colorado, we had the market uh, returns compounding at nearly, the market compounding at nearly 18% 8, over the last 20 years. And as a result, our plan was only fully funded once. To assume that we're going to have that type of run-up again over the next 20 years is a complete fallacy. Uh, also, the notion that everybody is contributing the same amount is a fallacy. Using Colorado as an, exa as an example, Congressman, uh, we have uh, government workers who, according to this, uh, this year's budget, have been asked to contribute a mandatory of 12.5 percent of their paychecks into the pension system. The problem in Colorado is that government workers only represent 15 percent of the membership in the pension system. Everybody else, all 85 percent of other members, school teachers, higher education, local government workers, they only have to contribute at 8 percent and they get the same benefits. So if we're talking about fairness here, let's have everybody contribute the same amount. Let's have everybody retire at the same age. Not some get to retire at 60, others get to retire at 58. Uh, there is no uniformity, and Colorado is not alone. Many states uh, don't have uniformity in contribution levels or retirement ages. Uh, so this is about economic the fairness. The time has expired, mm -hmm. and so if Mr. you want Chairman. to quickly well, Mr. Chairman, I would like to just thank all the panel for being here today and for their contribution. I know they've spent a lot of time uh, on these public employee pensions, and I appreciate uh, the panel's time today, and I appreciate your time, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing. I thank the gentleman. Uh, let me just remind members on both sides that we want to try to keep from impugning motives and stick to really what the subject, the heart of the subject is, and it was really dealing with the transparency, the accounting methods, and ultimately, are these pension plans fair to the workers at the end of the day. And, and so uh, we will continue to work on this issue. And I want to thank the panelists uh, for joining us today. Uh, you've all been very helpful. Please be advised that members may have written questions that they will submit uh, to you. And those <laughs> questions and answers will be made part of the official record. And with that, uh, this hearing is now adjourned. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you.